When you write a diet book and people don't like your diet book, they don't like your diet book. But you, when you write a book where you have to make that decision to pull back the kimono and tell everything about you, maybe those times when you were a parent when you could have kicked yourself because you sucked, or maybe when you were in the hospital and so scared and trying to figure out how you get your mindset right because you were so scared your, your son was going to die and you weren't doing everything possible for it, you had to pull back every single thing in your life if someone doesn't like that book, they don't like you. I didn't want to write that book. Here I am. I'm a nutrition and fitness expert. My whole identity is wrapped around helping people get healthy. And I had four New York Times bestsellers and that was my life. Except there was something more there that I needed to share and I just didn't want to do it. My agent had gotten me an amazing book advance to write the story that really needed to be told about my son. And my son, when he was 16, he was the victim of a hit and run and literally left for dead in the street. And I launched my first New York Times bestseller, literally bedside with him in a coma, fighting for his life. And my agent was convinced this was the most important story for me to tell because it had helped her save her own son's life. So I really thought about it. And if I'm going to do something, I'm going to go all in. So not only did I write the book, I also did a documentary about the whole thing, which was totally crazy because I had to relive the accident scene where my son was left for dead after being hit by a hit and run driver. I had to go back to the hospital to the night where we didn't know he was going to make it through the night and drive back through the drive when they airlifted him and we didn't think he was going to be alive when we got there. I went through every little bit of that along with his childhood and those times when as a mom I just didn't think I made the right decisions and I put that work out there and what's happened because of that are a couple of things. First of all, my son's better than he ever was before. I've become an amazing role model for him and for all these other mothers out there fighting for their sons and fighting for their families. But I've also become real for people. And so this is what I would encourage. Share everything about yourself. We worry so much about being perceived as an expert, about being perceived as a professional. But you know when people really buy into you? When they get you, when they see you, when they see all of you. So show it to them. JJ, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. I'm super glad to be here. That was uh, so inspiring. And first, I'm so sorry that you went through that whole experience with your son being left for dead. I can't even imagine what that must have been like as a mother uh, to have experienced that. And then to write a book about it and to put yourself out there vulnerably uh, is also super duper commendable. So uh, I think that that's just a... It's a beautiful story, and it kind of alludes to what we were talking about right before we turned on the mics, that why do people even need a reminder yeah. to show and share themselves authentically with others in the world? So uh, you brought that up. Tell us why. I know. that just It just kills me that you know everything now is about being authentic. I'm like, just be. Why would we ever have to be authentic? And I think, I think it's actually the big crime of social media. Mm -hmm. I now coach a lot of health experts and I say, you know what? Like, don't show them the perfect you. Tell them about the struggles. Tell them about, like, when I was writing the book, Warrior Mom, they're like, well, we wanted to know about when you cried. I go, I really actually don't cry, I sweat. Like, I'm not a crier, I, I'm an action taker. That's how I handle stress. But I was stressed, I was scared every single day. My gosh, you don't know if your son's gonna be alive when you get to the hospital in the morning. It's absolutely scary, you've gotta share that struggle. And I think that we feel like if we share that, people won't like us, mm -hmm. right? And the reality is when you share that people love you, right? That's what they fall in love with. They fall in love with that part of you, that, that part of you, that hurt part of you, that little kid that might have gotten beat up on the playground and then came back out. That's the one. Right. That's the one they want to fight yeah. for too. Yeah. Question for you. Before you started sharing so much of yourself publicly, what would you say your public image is? I know you alluded to like people thinking, oh, you know, JJ's perfect. Okay. So here's where I yeah. really think it stemmed from okay. is... I was like one of the early reality show people way back when. I mean, when you think about it, I was on Dr. Phil for two years when he started his weight loss challenges. Those were some of the first reality shows. Then I had my own primetime pilot on ABC. Then I did this one on TLC called Freaky Eaters. And when you're the expert host, 
you're not showing like you're only showing the perfect mm -hmm. you're showing all the bad stuff on the guests i mean I, I remember once one of the guests was like scratching his butt and he goes don't let them show that i'm like they're so that is like so going up there are you right, kidding yeah. like all right. you need to do is fart and we would be in seven heaven right. so you know but us as the experts we were supposed to be perfect and yeah. amazing and always yeah. look great on tv and it's and so you get used to that and i came off of tv and everything started to be video but i was used to having perfect sets and perfect lighting and perfect makeup and everything else and then as we started to make that shift, especially when I did the docu-series, and I remember here I am doing this documentary and my producer, who had also been my PBS producer, was like, you're not going to have like your hair and makeup done for this. And I, I need you to look like a mom and like look like, and I'm like, all right, okay. I'm very coachable, right? But man, it was like a relief. And I now show up most of the stuff I do live like I just had someone, I was at another one, they did my makeup, just oh. so FYI, that's okay. why. I got like good makeup for All right, so I mean, that's why <laughs> I just came off of somewhere else. I did my, but a lot of the stuff I do when I'm doing like Facebook and Instagram lives, like I just came from the gym, mm -hmm. you know? Like this is it because gosh, if we make people think that, you know, we give them these unattainable ways, no one will do it. But if you show them, hey, I'm here and I've done all this stuff. It's been 30 freaking years of slaving. Like I didn't just wake up one day and I had these books and I'd done this TV. I started out in high school doing this stuff. I've been working the entire time. And for every success you've seen, I've had like 10 or more like total bombshell failures, like not a little mm -hmm. failure, like blow it all up failures, mm -hmm. right? We've got to hear those things because we always, I think we human nature has this tendency to go, oh, it was easy for him. Right. Look at him. He's got great hair. It must be easy for him. So thank you so much for sharing so openly. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious with some of those struggles, having started so early and gotten to where you are today, I'm curious to know some of the breakthroughs that you've had personally that's allowed you to get to this point. So I'm an adopted kid and it's a really interesting thing. And I always wanted to have my, my own children. Now adopted parents probably should get extra bonus points, right? So, and the people who raised you are your parents. However, there is something called a primal wound. And, and I never really wanted to talk about it because it felt so ungrateful. And I'll share a little story about it, like this that was really quite crazy. So adopted kids, there's something about your mom. Like when your mom gives you up for adoption, it's a thing. Like, like you can say, oh, they had to want you more to have you and oh, she had to really love you to give you up. But the bottom line is your mom, who's supposed to love you no matter what, gave you away. Like that leaves a mark. And it is, it's called a primal wound. And all my life growing up, this is really ridiculous, but all my life growing up, I was convinced Barbara Streisand was my mother. <laughs> because, you know, we bear such a resemblance to each other. <laughs> you know, I was sure of it though. And I kept telling my mom growing up to call Barbara, you know, no. call her. I, my mom was feeling like, what? You know, and cause I wanted to be a singer and a dancer and all that. In my 20s, I finally decided to go look for my birth parents because I was so different than the people who raised me. I am a super, like a little bit of a gypsy. I, was, I grew up in Berkeley, so I always say I'm kind of a high maintenance hippie, but I was a little bit of a gypsy. I always like to travel everywhere I possibly could, but then super science and business oriented, very entrepreneurial. I grew up with a country club mom. They golfed. Um, she stayed at home. My dad had a job. He was waiting for a ship to come in. I was like, I don't understand these people at all. Like we'd have the same predictable vacation each year for two weeks at the same place. I mean, like just absolutely the antithesis of what would be interesting to me. <laughs> and so I go find my birth parents. Birth dad is a multi multimillionaire self-made no entrepreneur. Wow. And that, yeah. And that side of the family are models, models, and athletes and entrepreneurs. Other side of the family, mom's side of the family, scientists. Wow. Scientists, I mean, and not wow, just scientists. the question like, of nature versus like, nurture. Right, oh, I will tell you, it is so clear to me because if, if it was nurture, I would be a stay-at-home mom at a country club drinking martinis. Like it, it's, and, and probably an alcoholic. My birth dad, my adopted dad was a super alcoholic. Like I could, you know, Mm -hmm. smoke her whole bit and so here I am I find them and, and birth mom total traveling gypsy so I meet them 
I move the same, I have the same tastes. I was wearing the same outfit when I got off the plane and met my mom. Same haircut, same outfit. My birth dad meets me and says, oh my gosh, you moved just like her. That's crazy, right? So that whole thing happens. I go back and tell my parents about it to tell them, you know, I just wanted to find out my roots and what was going on because I was considering having kids. My birth dad called me a selfish bitch or my adopted dad, like that I would go do this. This was so rude, blah, 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 right? Then I go back and see my birth mom again and then she dentures me again. So I'm like going, (laughs) but here's the lesson. Here's the lesson. Because for years, I could not create really clear relationships with anybody. Because in my mind, you do that, they leave you, Mm. right? They ditch you like it keeps happening. So clearly I'm not lovable, right? Then um, I went through and did a lot of work on this. And I actually went through this thing called 40 Years of Zen. One of my best friends is this guy, Dave Asprey. He was like, you're coming. I go to 40 Years of Zen. I do this. And then I go to Burning Man. I do those two things, right? This is like this one, two of I'm going on this massive self-exploration. Oh, yeah. And how long ago is this? This was five years ago. Oh, cool. I was at that Burning Man. So that um, I go through all of this, come out of it. And I meet the love of my life. And I will actually, I never would allow my, like everything changed like that. Wow. Right? Yeah. So cool. Went through the whole forgiveness, forgave my birth mom, forgave my adopted mom. Both of them were, because I never wanted to talk about it before because it sounded really like, oh, you know, you know, I'm sitting here going, wait a minute. I was raised with a nice family. No one beat anybody. You know, yeah. I was fed. I had a great, you know, so you don't want to be like an ungrateful snot, you For know. Sure. For sure. <laughs> but the bottom line is you feel like it created some stuff that I think we have to be honest about. But boy, once you're honest about it, what I realized from all of it was, A, you know, you go through forgiveness, which is what 40 Years of Zen and Neurofeedback teach you is how to do forgiveness because you're wearing this headset and and you can tell if you're really forgiving or you're lying. Yeah. So um, went through all of that. And then I realized that I could actually create my own family. So I did. And it was funny when I got married to the love of my life, um, I had my like family wedding picture was my adopted mom, Dave Asprey, my one of my sons, my ex-husband, my other son, Brendan Burchard's mom, you know, <laughs> and my buddies, Mike Koenigs and Vivian Glick. Like that was my family. And I went, these are my people. They're here and I can have them all as my family. So that was kind of like this big takeaway. That's so cool. Thank you for sharing. And I can certainly relate in my own way. And I think the funny thing is the fact that anyone who's even listening here, we are so fortunate to even be alive, or at least I think it's a gift and fortunate to be alive, to be able to breathe this air and be able to have this human experience is a gift. Yeah. So we've already, we've already won the lottery, essentially. Yeah. So to then, you know, be even more like nitpicky as to, you know, what we feel like we're worthy of and what we want to share because maybe other people wouldn't relate to us if you shared that story, saying, thinking maybe that your suffering wasn't as bad as other people's suffering. Okay, when so as humans, we suffer. It's a part of life. But here's what's really cool about it. Here's the next level of cool. You ready? Yeah, bring it. Okay. Like, this is so cool. I'm glad you're sitting down. So... I am always looking for things that will get me out of my comfort zone. Now, when you nearly lose a child, it is almost impossible to get out of your comfort zone. Like, right? I mean, because when you go through that, you're like, all right, like, you know, very few things rattle my cage. Mm -hmm. I met this woman whose life's work is to rehabilitate the most challenging incarcerated people. Turn them around. And I think the recidivism rate in um, prisons, it's something like 70 to 90% of them get out, go back in. She has a 93% success rate. And what she does, she goes, these are amazing entrepreneurs. They just put it in the wrong direction. So what she does is she has a whole program where she teaches them in prison gratitude and business development and personal development, right? And she brings in entrepreneurs to help them. So last week I went. Because this got me out of my comfort zone. So I went to Kern County Maximum Security Correctional Facility. And we were doing this, this work where we were talking about forgiveness, right? Now, forgiveness sets you free. That's mm-hmm. a big part of my book, Warrior Mom. It's talking about how forgiveness sets you free. But it was because I went through 40 years of Zen. And then all of that happened. And 
we, I was sitting with this guy, um, 31 year old guy who I just instantly had a heart connection with. I was like, okay, he, he, because you have to go through all these exercises together and do this stuff. And he said, I, we were working on forgiveness. He goes, I can't forgive. My mom was on drugs when she had me because one of the things they had us show was like, we were stepping to the line, this line when things were true for us. And every single person who was incarcerated when they said, you know, did you have a parent who was on drugs or alcohol or incarcerated? All of them stepped to the line, right? And he goes, my mom was on drugs when she, when she was pregnant with me. She was on drugs my whole childhood. I never saw her. She wasn't around. I can never forgive her. I'm here because of her. Hmm. And I'm like, but if you can't forgive her, you're not leaving here. Like, you can't leave here if you can't forgive her. So I told him my story. And you know what's so interesting is you think when you're telling a story, it's so specific to you that the other person can't relate. But the re the the deal is, the more specific it is to you, the more they can start to see their own story in it. And I'm telling them the story about how much I was, you know, I couldn't forgive either mom who were doing the best they could. Like, you know, I mean, you know, my mom, poor mom who could never have kids. And then my other mom who that was thought she was doing the best thing she could because she couldn't take care of a kid at that time. So I'm telling him this whole story and how I never really let myself have love. I wasn't lovable, blah, blah, blah. And finally I got through it and I learned a process of being able to forgive and I did it. And all of a sudden now I have the love of my life and he's crying. And I said, could you maybe just be open to the possibility that you could forgive? And he's like, I can. And I'm like, all right, like talk about like, yeah. that is cool. Yeah. That's so cool. And I'm glad you were able to kind of get that through to him because it makes so much sense. And at the same time, it's counterintuitive and we cling to our mm -hmm. stories. We yeah. cling to the stories that we tell ourselves on repeat in our heads so to make he maybe he never would have even realized that. Okay, that he could just rewrite it. <laughs> freedom was on the other side of forgiveness. Yeah. So that's amazing. Uh, I want to ask you a couple of questions about health because you have been supporting people for <laughs> decades in transforming their health and losing weight. And uh, I personally have like a little health thing, so I figured I might as well, you know, start with myself here. Um, I have a runny nose, hmm. and it's kind of funny about it is I didn't even realize it was a big deal. I became like okay with it, like it's the status quo. Like I've probably kind of always had a cold for most of the last decade, maybe even longer. But since it was just the status quo, I never really thought twice about it. And now I'm in this new relationship and I'm constantly being reminded like, your nose is running, like what are you gonna do about it? Go to a doctor. And so I believe it's probably like a food allergy type of situation. But uh, I figured- It's one of the classic here. signs of one. <laughs> you know, I immediately was like, do we have dairy? <laughs> yeah, dairy, okay. Um, I've been cutting it out. Totally. I cheat All with right. pizza about once a week, but well, let's, of let's that, think I'm about that. Here. So you're sitting on a on a stool right now. What yeah. if you were sitting on that stool and there were seven tacks on that stool? How would your butt feel? <laughs> Probably would hurt pretty oh. bad. Yeah. So what we'll do is we'll pull out six tacks, but we'll leave one. How's it feel? Still stings. Still stings. Yeah. Or we could just take all the tacks away, but once a week you'll sit down the stool with the tack. You get in the point. Stings. Yeah. yeah so what happens is uh, food intolerance, and it's not yeah. a true allergy. A true allergy is someone opens the peanuts on the plane and you have to give them right. the EpiPen. Yeah. Um, and that's why this is so different because it's a low grade symptom that usually people just get used to and they think it's normal for them. Yeah. Sound like, yeah. right? And so it could be a little headache, could be brain fog, could be some bloating, could be joint pain, could be a runny nose or throat clearing, all those things. I always look first to, could it be a food thing? And so I did a ton of this, where this all came from, I wish I could say I was some smarty pants that figured this out, like sitting somewhere, but I was teaching doctors how to interpret a food sensitivity test. Mm -hmm. And this started about 10 years ago. And I got the opportunity to look at a lot of food sensitivity tests. And what I discovered was, it was always the same foods. We have, if you look at it, there's this thing called a food elimination diet. It's been around for decades. It's very confusing and complicated to do. They have all these foods pulled out. And I was like looking at these food sensitivity tests and I go, all the foods they have on the food elimination plan are not in this uh, showing up on this test. Showing up on this test are eggs and dairy 
and then soy, corn, and peanuts. So it was always eggs and dairy, soy, corn, and peanuts. Gluten's a different type of test. Mm -hmm. Gluten causes all sorts of hell, though. Mm -hmm. And then below that, sugar and artificial sweeteners actually change your gut microbiome to make you have more susceptible to food intolerance. So that's where, you know, I would test people and then wait for three weeks, see all those results and take them off the foods and they'd get better. And they'd walk in with throat, you know, like congestion, joint pain, headaches. And then within three weeks, like usually within the first week, those would go away. Mm. But three to four weeks, sometimes in the tougher cases, it could take even six weeks and they'd lose weight. Then I thought, well, while we're waiting for the test results to come back, because that takes three weeks, we'll just put them on the, we'll pull the foods out. And then I realized I didn't need the test. <laughs> so that was kind of like this migration. Now, mm -hmm. if you do the food challenge and you still don't have all the results, then you go do testing. But why spend money if you don't need to, mm -hmm. right? And I think the best way to, to connect the dots is just by pulling the foods out, giving yourself healing foods, letting your body cool down, and then go back one by one. But it takes at least three to four weeks to get your body to cool down. Because what happens when you eat a food that doesn't work for you is that there's the, the protein, it's the protein from the food that does it, an antigen. And it goes goes into your general circulation. It shouldn't, but our gut gets more permeable than it should because of stress. You mentioned you were stressed. And gluten does this, and a lot of different artificial sweeteners and, and sugars do it. Fructose does it big time. A lot of different pain medications do it. So your gut gets more permeable than it should be. The little food particle, especially if you didn't digest it well, you didn't chew well, or you're over the age of 30, or you're under any kind of stress, goes out into circulation. Your body goes, what the hell is that? It launches an immune attack, creates these antibodies. They go grab onto it and create these immune complexes. If it was every once in a while every couple of weeks, macrophage eats it up, gets it out. That's not what happens. It's a little bit, little bit, little bit. It mm. builds up and creates these ongoing symptoms. And now once you stop eating the food, you still have these immune right. complex. Right. So it really takes three to four weeks to clear those things out altogether at the very least, sometimes longer. So that's where you have to start. Gotcha. So I got but some homework to do. go away. All of them. I would mm. love that. But just so. imagine. And then if not, you know, that's kind of step one. Here's the thing. When I pull people off of foods, it's rare that someone doesn't find at least one or two foods that don't work for them. And honestly, most of us should not be having gluten's for a lot of reasons, not a good food. I mean, just the glyphosate issue alone. But what it does to increase something called zonulin in your gut that makes it more permeable, very problematic, raises mm -hmm. insulin, not a good food. Like there's nothing good there. Mm -hmm. And dairy for most of us, we shouldn't be eating. It's different if we're living over in Europe. We're not, we're here. So different. Um, and soy, of course, you're a man. I'm assuming you want good testosterone levels. So that's not one a good one for you either. And corn's a crappy food. It's genetically modified. So that should go. And peanut's not a nut. It's a legume, high in lectins. So these are easy things to remove anyway. Gotcha. It's not like you're pulling out like health foods. These are things people think are health foods that are not healthy. Mm. Question for you in regards to the show is all about being real. What is something that people should be more real about as it regards to their health? So I think the big challenge that we have is that we try to take on too much and tr like, like we know where we are and we have a pretty good idea of where we want to be, but we try to do too much too soon to get to that place. So what we need to be more real about is that you can really only, it's, this is never, you're never done. You're done with your health when you're done with your life, right? Up until then, you're always working on your health. You're always a work in progress in everything, every part of your life, right? It's not like you ever get done. Um, but especially with health. And the way to get better at health is to work on one thing at a time, which is not what most people do when they go, all right, like when I have people do any of my books or programs, there's just one thing. Like right now, work on your food intolerances. Figure out which foods work for you and which foods don't. Once you get past that, maybe you have to work on your immune system or maybe we need to get you sleeping better. But you start with one thing. What I see people do where they really mess up is they go, you know what? I, you know, I need to lose some weight. Example. I need to lose some weight. So I'm going to 
um, start cutting my calories. First of all, that's stupid, but I'm going to start cutting my calories and my fat. Then I'm going to start exercising more. I'll start running every day. And then I got to do something about the stress. Cause I know that's supposed to do something with your belly fat, you know, so already, and then I should take supplements. They add all this stuff up. And of course they're never going to be able to do that. Whereas if they just said, you know what, I need to do something about my weight. Step one, why don't I just improve the quality of my food mm-hmm. and unprocess my diet? That's just that. When I nail that, I'll go to the next thing. And all along the way, because you commit with your cash, I'll hire a coach who will guide me on that, shorten the learning curve, avoid the overwhelm, you know, and ensure I actually do what I said I was going to do. And I'm going to tie it to a really big why that will make it important and significant for me. Mm -hmm. I think that's so good. And I appreciate you kind of dialing it back to one thing. I think when we focus on one thing, like... One of the best books out there, The One Thing. I love The One Thing. I love Gary Kohler. I'm so obsessed with him. But, you know, I learned this from doing it wrong. I learned this from overwhelming. I'm so sorry, early clients. I'm so, (laughs) so sorry. Because I literally, you know, and and I coach a lot of doctors. Mm -hmm. And I'll sit down with them and they go, I've got this. Because it's either a five or a seven step program that they have. And it's always the same steps. Mm -hmm. And they want to throw them all at someone. I go, do not do that. Like, pick the one thing first. So I, I think we have in our big, you know, goal to get better, we just try to do too much. So we do nothing. For sure. Right. It requires patience. Yeah. <laughs> patience and action. And yes. Yes. And accountability. Yes. As we alluded to earlier. Huge. And, you know, I mean, here's the easiest way to get healthier. And you already showed it. Like all of a sudden you have someone going, hey, what the heck is that? Because I know my husband just leaking nose just dripped on me there. And I go, what the hell was that? Like, what was that? You know, he doesn't normally have a runny nose because um, I pulled him off of gluten and dairy when yeah, I met him. Okay. But, um, you know, having people around you who are healthier fitter, more positive than you is the easiest way to get healthier, fitter, and more positive, Mm -hmm. right? Like, Mm -hmm. like if you know where you want to go, hang out with people who are there. What are some of your favorite foods? Ooh, um, I love wild salmon and grass fed beef. I do smoothies every single day with, I have a bone broth protein. Um, I love sushi. Absolutely love it to pieces. Um, I love sake too. And I stay away from that because that is very easy to drink way too much of. (laughs) So I do not touch the sake. (laughs) Like that's not it. That sake and champagne are like the two that are just like, Oh, what? Oh, uh -oh, where'd that go? Right. You know? Um, but I think, gosh, if you could have a role place where you could order your coating, you could order your rice or no rice or brown rice. Mm -hmm. You could order your main, which would be like wild salmon or, um, halibut or scallops and then you could order your extras like avocado or cucumber wouldn't that be the greatest restaurant my husband's going we are not starting another business <laughs> no we're not you know <laughs> it sounds delicious so I would definitely come down to town yeah i mean here's out. the thing i eat um i got that down the street i got this over here um i basically eat a load of vegetables some either you know it's kind of like grassa beef or wild fish mm-hmm. and shakes and my bars, I live on, I eat a lot of bars, um, these collagen bars. And avocados and nuts and broccoli and cauliflower and Brussels sprouts and wild rice and squash. And I mean, that's kind of it. It sounds delicious. That's <laughs> Pretty all you simple. need. It's not that, like, that- like, it is not that hard to eat healthy. And yeah. we, like, cook every single night. It's yeah. This is really not a hard thing, yeah. you know? I mean, most of the things we make, like, every night we make either Brussels sprouts, cauliflower rice, or broccoli and then we either do wild rice or squash or a little bit of little teeny potatoes that we let cool for the resistant starch and then we do some protein like this is not hard and then you have leftovers and you have them the next day you sound pretty disciplined with like with the food you put in your body so my question is do you ever have any cheat days and everyone so, always wants always to ask, ask about the cheat thing oh, yes yeah. um truthfully when you get really clear on what foods how you feel when you eat certain foods you just stop that um because You know, that whole diet mentality of it's a good day, it's a bad day. Like, that's just ridiculous. If you want to have the piece of cake, have the piece of cake. But just know what the piece of cake is going to do to you. Just like if you were going to have like a whole bottle of wine, you'd know how you'd feel unless it was dry farm. So the deal is um, I know how I feel. I actually don't have a sweet tooth. I don't really like sugar. If I was going to do anything, it would be like eating a little bit more of that salted grass-fed steak or having, you know, a bigger glass of red wine. But it's just not... I got rid of all of the food intolerances, which make you addicted to the foods. Like Mm -hmm. when you have a food intolerance, you are actually addicted to the food you eat. I also know my trigger foods. Um, Like if I were to go to a movie theater 
and have a bucket of popcorn, I would have all the popcorn in the movie theater. Like you'd have to haul me out of the movie theater. So I don't ever touch stuff like that. Yeah. I just don't. Like I know if something's a trigger, because even if something's healthy, which that's not healthy, but let's say, you know, you loved um, macadamia nuts. Uh, eating a hundred of them is not okay, right? Too much healthy food's unhealthy. So you got to know your trigger foods sure. too. But I think the important takeaway there is you can actually get through any of that type of weird food addiction stuff that you have. You can get through any of that stuff, especially by figuring out which foods you're intolerant to, right? Mm -hmm. So as we wrap up this interview, what can we do to support you? You know, I think here's the biggest thing. If you've heard anything in here that lit you up, that you went, oh, I should start doing that, whether it's figuring out your food intolerances or getting a good night's sleep, or, you know, maybe volunteering at a maximum security prison or supporting someone like Tim Ryan, who's doing food policy, like take the action, right? I mean, that's how things happen. Yeah. But it's again, take one action. Just start with one. If you haven't read Gary Keller's The One Thing, that's the, that's the first action. Another homework take. assignment right there. Oh my gosh. This show's all about being real. What's been real for you during this 45 minute conversation? So I have never, ever, I just figured this audience is, is, a, is a kind not judgmental, open to possibility audience because I never tell anyone that I go to Burning Man. Really? No, oh, never cool. do. Um, it's funny because I go with my buddy Dave Asprey and it's cool for his brand, yeah, right. and, uh, but, but not so much for mine. How many years have you got? Uh, five. Five in a row? So yeah, four, five. I think this next one's five or is this next one six? Nice. Anyway. So you register for tickets? They're, they're oh, I've got right tickets out. and yeah. the whole thing. Yeah, we're okay, all, nice. we're all go. good. Yes. This is going to be number 10 for me, 10 in wow. a row. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And it's it's so funny because people have never gone. They think it's like a bunch of people on drugs having sex in the dirt. And I'm like, well, you could do that, but you could also <laughs> do that at home. Right. Um, yeah. Or you can go like meet some of the most amazing people, go to some of the most incredible lectures, see some of the most amazing like lights ever, like the drones last year. Sure. Wow, yeah. you know. And uh, we had a wedding ceremony in the temple, and um, and I brought my son who wanted to be an electrical engineer, wow. so that he could Mind and, blown, I'm sure. and create sustainable create sustainable communities that yeah. was his goal like he's like coolest mom ever you know <laughs> I'm like yes okay i win hands down but but you know i think it's the fastest way to help people see that we're all the same mm -hmm. at the bottom you know at the core we are all so similar we're all the same mm -hmm. and to really be open to possibilities out there you know thank you for being real so last question of the interview, what uh, would you like to leave with guests of the show today to live an authentic life they're proud of? Maybe something's coming to your mind now. Maybe it's something as you were heading over here that you thought you wanted to share that you haven't had a chance to yet. The floor is hmm. yours. You know, um, this actually came up yesterday on an interview and people talk all the time about, about leaving a legacy and what I've leaned into in the last year and just really just kind of changed the thought is what if we don't leave a legacy? What if we just live the legacy? So you can start right now. Boom, the one and only JJ Virgin. JJ, this has been so fun. Yes, it has. Yeah, I'll see you on the playa. <laughs> exactly, that'll be awesome. <laughs>